um, I'll get started. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is George and I'm from UCLA. Uh, my co-author is Blake Lima. Uh, he's a cohort of mine. Um, uh, the, spe uh, the title of our talk today is An Arguments Analysis of Cognitive Object in Chomp. Um, so uh, descriptively, uh, descriptively speaking, uh, in cognitive object constructions, uh, a typically intransitive verb takes an object uh, in which the head now is morphologically or semantically, uh, semantically uh, cognate to the verb. Uh, in one, we have some examples from English. Uh, Mary left a sad laugh at the meeting. And compared to regular noun objects, uh, it, uh, cognitive objects uh, are claimed to have distinct properties. Uh, for instance, in English, uh, they require uh, modification. They cannot be uh, definite. Uh, they cannot be topicalized or passivized. Um, in previous studies, uh, various analyses uh, have been proposed regarding the syntactic status of cognitive objects. They, uh, they have been analyzed in, as adjuncts or arguments. It's also claimed that in a single language, you might have uh, both um, uh, adverbial or, uh, or argumental um, cognitive objects. And um, pre, um, nevertheless, not much attention has been paid to uh, African languages. So in this talk, uh, we focus on, uh, in this talk, we fo uh, in, yeah, in this talk, we will be focusing on the photo dialect uh, of Chang, which is a uh, grass fields language, uh, Bantu language spoken in Cameroon. Uh, the main goal for today uh, is to provide a description of cognitive object constructions in this language um, uh, here uh, illustrated in 3B, which means uh, he or she run the run. And uh, analytically speaking, uh, by using both uh, cross-linguistic comparison and also chunk specific evidence, we will argue uh, that uh, chunk cognitive objects behave like selected uh, uh, arguments in a, sim in a similar way as uh, regular noun objects. Uh, for the rest of the talk, we will begin with um, introduction of the, uh, of the language, and we will give an overview of the productive uh, verb noun alternation in this language. Then we will lay out our um, 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 uh, arguments for, the, for our analysis. Uh, in the end, we will conclude. So beginning with some background on Chang, uh, it is an SVO language. So in four, we have Ninglela uh, Mbap, the man cooked the meat. Uh, so SVO. It, Chang is also a tone language. So it contrasts high and low tone levels plus downstep of each, although downstep low is not contrastive. And it also contrasts uh, level low and low falling tone sentence finally. So in five, we see examples of all the contrastive tones of Chang. So high, downstep high, low, and low falling. Like other grass fields languages, uh, Chang has a subset of the noun classes found in Bantu. So in six, uh, we have the inventory of noun classes in Chang. As you can see, not all classes can be uh, distinguished solely based on the noun class prefix. Um, so there are also concord elements that appear in places like uh, possessive pronouns that can differentiate the classes from each other. Like related languages, uh, past and future time in Chang uh, is divided into up to five ten tenses each. Uh, so examples of some of the tenses are given in seven. So in A, we have what we are calling the distant past. So aletonga sung means he called a bird some time ago. In 7b, we have a recent past, meaning he called a bird just now. Um, and in 7c, a uh, future of some time in the future. Uh, relevant for uh, later in the talk, there is also object concord in Chang. So there's a set of object concord markers that occur between a verb and a direct object. This marker depends on the noun class of the object and can be segmental and tonal as in 8a, aletonga sung, where you have a copy of the vowel of the verb root for the class one object bird. The concord marker can also be just tonal as in 8b, so aletong pr, uh, where it's just a low tone uh, corresponding to the class nine object dog. The inventory of these object markers is given in nine. Uh, and the important distinction to remember uh, is that for class one nouns, the object concord is high, high tone. And for all other classes, the object concord is low. 
Um, and for our speaker, the segmental portion of these markers, except for class one, are almost always absent. So these object marking uh, morphemes are only present in certain tense aspect constructions, and they're also absent under negation, and this is shown in 10. So in 10a, we have the affirmative, uh, where the low tone object concord is present uh, on the right edge of the verb. Under negation in 10b, uh, the object concord is now gone, and we just have the high tone on the, the verb. As far as verb tone generally goes in Chang, the, uh, verbs can belong to one of two tonal classes, either high or low, uh, but the actual surface tone depends on the construction. So for example, low tone verbs often appear uh, with a downstep high tone on the root, um, as in 11b. So we have a high tone verb tong uh, with a high tone and a low tone verb kong, uh, meaning like, with a downstep high. Okay, now for an overview of the verb noun alternation in Chang. So in Chang, uh, there's a productive process to derive nouns from verbs. Um, and these verbs and derived nouns share the same root. Uh, like regular nouns, cognate nouns uh, also have noun class markers like uh, le or a. And the difference between le and a here is just due to there being uh, different types of nominal derivation in Chang. But we can see that in each case, the root of the derived noun is the same as the root of the, the verb. These cognate nouns can surface in object position um, as shown in 14 and 15. So the intransitive sentence uh, she coughed is a la cui. Uh, and in 14b, we can see that the cognate noun uh, a cui can appear in object position, a la cui a cui. Uh, and likewise for sleep in 15. These cognate nouns can also surface in the subject position uh, as shown in 16. So in 16a, we have le chut a faux le che ngong pong ga. Uh, the chief's arrival made me happy, where le che, uh, the derived noun uh, arrival, appears in subject position. And likewise for smile in 16b. Uh, it's been argued that there's an unergative restriction on cognate object constructions. Uh, so only unergative verbs can appear in the cognate object construction, uh, while no unaccusative verbs can do the same. So we see this for English in 17, where it's ungrammatical to say she arrived a glamorous arrival and likewise for B and C. In Chang, it, it appears that there's a similar restriction. So we see this in 18, a le for he or she arrived uh, is fine, but a le le she arrived an arrival is not okay, it's ungrammatical. Uh, all right, uh, next I will um, show the argument and properties of Chang cognitive objects. Uh, using both uh, cross-linguistic comparison and also Chang internal evidence. Uh, beginning with a cross-linguistic um, comparison, first uh, we will check whether the cognitive objects are compatible with, with determiners, uh, starting with, um, with uh, Russian, uh, in which you uh, a cognitive object in this language uh, can be marked either in the accusative or instrumental. And interestingly, uh, it's claimed that only the accusative marked uh, cognitive objects, but not the instrumental marked ones, are compatible with uh, demonstratives like uh, 19 or quantifiers, uh, uh, 19A or quantifiers um, like uh, um, 19B. Uh, and um, this has been used as an uh, as um, evidence to argue that uh, the, the in Russian the accusative marked uh, cognitive objects are. Uh, uh, arguments, whereas the instrumental marked ones are uh, adjuncts. Um, we see something similar in SAS and Arabic. Um, uh, in, in, in this language, the cognitive objects are not compatible with quantifiers or possessors either. And this again is used as an uh, evidence to say that the in SAS and Arabic cognitive uh, uh, objects are adver uh, adverbial. Um, in contrast, in Chang, uh, the cognitive objects are all compatible with demonstratives like uh, 21, um, uh, uh, he or she run that one, a possessor uh, in, in 21b, John la quay, ma quay, me, or John la quay, ma quay, se. They are compatible with uh, demonstratives like those or uh, possessors like um, his. And in addition, they are co also compatible with quantifiers in 21C, uh, John Lequay, uh, 
John Lequim Ngua McQuin, uh, John uh, um, coughed every cough. Uh, next, we'll see uh, whether they can be pronominalized. Um, going back to Russian, uh, we see a sim uh, we see the similar uh, dichotomy between accusative marked uh, cognitive objects and the instrumental marked ones. So in 22, we see that the accusative marked cognitive objects can be pronominalized, uh, whereas the in 23, the instrumental marked uh, uh, cognitive object cannot be pr uh, pronominalized. Um, uh, whereas in Sassan Arabic, uh, a cognitive object cannot be uh, pronominalized either as 24 shows. And uh, with respect to English, uh, it's claimed that in, uh, uh, the cognitive objects can only be pronominalized in the subject position, but not in the object position. Uh, so in 25A, you, it's, it's okay to say Mary smiled, a mysterious, a mysterious smile, and it, it was attractive. Whereas it's degraded to say Mary smiled a beautiful smile and Jane smiled it too. However, uh, in Chang, we do not see this type of restriction, uh, namely, they can be pronominalized in the object position as well. Uh, 26 shows how a regular noun object uh, can be um, uh, uh, can be pronominalized in the object position uh, with uh, by e. Uh, in, th in 27, we have examples of cognitive objects. Uh, Mary in A, uh, Mary Lazinga Lazing, John Zinga, John Zinga Ise. Uh, so dance here can be pr pronominalized. In 27B, uh, we have John Lawi, uh, John Lawi, Mawi, Melagua, uh, Mary Lawi, Wapse. So here, um, four laughs can be pronominalized uh, as well. Uh, next, we will check whether they can be relativized, because in English, the fact that uh, a cognitive object uh, can be relativized with a gap in the non-predicate position uh, is being used as an argument uh, for the um, argument analysis of cognitive objects. Um, as uh, shown in 28, you can say Mona smiled a sarcastic smile, which uh, John photographed. Uh, going back to Chang, in 29, we see that you can say John a queer, a queer, said Mary le jour, which literally means John coughed the cough that Mary heard. Uh, next, we will uh, see whether they can be topicalized. Uh, in English, it's argued that uh, cognitive objects cannot undergo topicalization. Uh, so uh, 20, in, 30, uh, in 38, a shrill scream, John scream, is claimed to be uh, degraded or ungrammatical. Uh, however, this is not the case in Chang. 31 shows uh, how regular noun objects can uh, are topicalized in this language. Um, we have, we have, we can, so uh, we, uh, beginning with a full le domaining, uh, the chief hit a man or the chief hit the, hit the man, um, to topicalize the, uh, the object, we can say ning a full le uh, in which the uh, topicalized um, object occurs in the sentence initial position. Similarly, in 32, uh, we have, in 32a, we have John la que, la que, uh, he or she run around. So, uh, to topicalize the, uh, the cognitive object, uh, the uh, la que, the derived noun, uh, also occurs in the sentence initial position. Uh, lastly, we can check uh, how, they can, how these uh, cognitive objects can be questioned. In says in Arabic, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's claimed that you can only use how to question a, uh, a cognitive object as uh, 33 shows. Uh, however, in 34, uh, in Chang, uh, it's perfectly fine to use k, uh, a g to question the, um, the, uh, the cognitive object. Um, and, uh, you can, uh, and again, you can answer the question uh, using either a, a, a uh, uh, a segment answer or the a full sentence in 34 uh, B. Uh, yeah, to quickly summarize, uh, we, we believe that cross linguistic uh, um, uh, comparison supports the idea that Chang cognitive objects are argumental. Uh, next, we will present some Chang internal evidence uh, to, uh, uh, to, to show the, the, this point. Um, in, uh, in, more specifically, uh, we will show a strong par um, parallel distribution between cognitive objects and regular noun objects with respect to uh, both verbal tone and uh, word order variation. So beginning with verbal tone, um, and specifically verbal tone as it relates to the object concord markers discussed above, tone on intransitive verbs with cognate objects is the same as verb tone in transitive sentences, but different from those with a postverbal adjunct. So object markers occur between verb and object in the affirmative and trigger downstep when applicable, um, as shown in 35A through C. 
I mean, recall that the object marker for class five nouns like laugh, Louis, and class six nouns like birds, Musung, is identical. So in 35A, we have the cognate object construction, a Louis, Louis, uh, where the class five object marker appears at the right edge of the verb. Uh, for the homophonous transitive verb, laugh at, in 35B, a Louis, uh, the class one object marker appears for the pronominal object. And in 35C, for the object Musung, class six, we have a Louis Musung uh, with the same object marker as in the cognate object construction, the low tone at the right edge of the verb. Object markers between the verb and object are absent under negation as shown in 36. So under negation, the low tone object marker that appears on the verb in the affirmative in a Louis Louis, uh, it is absent in 36B. So a Louis Louis E. So uh, under negation, the low tone object marker in the cognate ob object construction uh, disappears and is replaced by a high tone in 36b. This is the exact same pattern observed for regular class five nouns uh, when they are objects. So this is shown in 37 for the verb we and the class five noun le kung pot. So in 37a, shu fo le we le kung with the low tone object marking morpheme at the right edge of the verb but under negation in 37b, uh, the low tone object marking morpheme is absent under negation, the exact same pattern we saw for the cognate object construction in 36. In contrast, when followed by an adjunct, an adjunct we, laugh, shows a different tonal pattern. So in 38, we see that uh, we, when followed by the adjunct loudly, it always has a level downstep high tone. So a le oui, monsieur, and a le te oui, monsieur, there's no change in tone when we oui is followed by an adjunct uh, in contrast to what we saw for the cognate object construction uh, in 36. All right, uh, lastly, we will, uh, we will uh, show that um, Cognitive objects and uh, regular noun objects behave similarly with respect to word order variations. Um, in Chang, it's observed that adjuncts cannot intervene between the, uh, between a verb and its, uh, its complements. So the example is given in 39. We see that a temporal adverb like Sunday ye, which means last week, can either be post uh, post VP in 30 uh, in 39A or pre VP in 39 uh, in 39B. And uh, the verb, uh, why, it's, uh, why it is pre, uh, pre VP, the verb will have um, a nasal prefix when, uh, when it's following uh, an adverb. Uh, what, uh, interestingly, in 39C, uh, what you cannot have is to, uh, is to put the, uh, the temporal adverb uh, between the verb and its, uh, its complement. And moving on to cognitive objects, we see a similar, uh, um, uh, what are the variation as well as restriction? Uh, in 40, uh, we see that Sunday year can follow the um, for, follow the cognitive object, uh, the namely the or the entire VP uh, we la we, or in 40B, um, Sunday year can also precede uh, the uh, the entire VP uh, and also trigger the same uh, the same a nasal prefix on the verb uh, and give us angry la we. And crucially, uh, Sunday ye cannot intervene between we, uh, the verb, and the derived uh, cognitive object la we either in, in 40C. Uh, in addition, uh, we also looked at negative invers uh, inversion. So we know that Chang is an otherwise pretty re uh, robust SVO language, and it has bipartite negation illustrated here in, uh, in 41B. Um, and, um, uh, you, uh, and with bipartite negation in, in 41B, uh, we get the usual uh, VO order, uh, VO or word order. And interestingly, uh, if we don't have the right edge negation as in 41C, um, all of a sudden you can get an OV order. Uh, so here, instead of um, in 41C, we have John Le De Ngap La, uh, where in which the, uh, the regular noun object precedes uh, the verb. And uh, going back to cognitive objects, we see something similar. Um, in 42, we have John Le, uh, John Le Ke Le Ke, uh, in, uh, where the cognitive object is in the pre-verbal, uh, is in the pre, uh, in the post-verbal position, 
and in 42, uh, John Le Decker, Le, uh, Le Decker, uh, in which we have the bipartite negation, and then we, we have the ordinary VO order. Uh, and crucially in 42, uh, getting rid of the, uh, the, the right edge negation uh, will give us the, uh, the OV order, just like the, um, uh, the reg regular noun object. So to, su uh, to summarize, uh, based on both uh, uh, ver uh, verbal tones and the word order variation, uh, we, uh, we believe that um, there is a strong uh, parallel distribution between uh, cognitive objects and regular noun objects in Chang. And um, by the way, this is not always the case with cognitive object across linguistically, because um, uh, it's observed that in Sassan Arabic, regular noun object, uh, objects are uh, post-verbal in 43a, but regular, uh, but a cognitive object are not, cannot be post-verbal uh, as 43b shows. So to conclude, uh, we've shown that cross-linguistic comparison and language internal evidence supports that Chong cognate objects show argument properties that are similar to regular noun objects. And we believe that these Chong internal diagnostics could be adopted in studying related languages with similar phenomena. Uh, and in the future, uh, some other data we are hoping to investigate are that these cognate objects seem to demote other post-verbal arguments. And we'd be happy to discuss uh, this data if anyone has a question. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, I'm the missing chair. I uh, was given the wrong Zoom link first off, so I popped in five minutes after. So I'm glad you guys um, found a way to get started. <laughs> um, so we can take 10 minutes or so for questions. Uh, I'll try to negotiate this novel Q&A thing as best I can. So questions can either be in the Q&A that's called Q&A or the chat. Um, there was one request a minute ago. Oh, and here again, can we have a copy or link to the handout? So maybe could you yeah. guys, yeah, if sure. you put it in the chat at some time. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm working on this right now. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, we can just ask a question. Uh, yeah. uh, actually, I see that there's a hand up. Just when there's a hand up from Dan Feng Wu, yeah. but I don't think I have a way to allow you to. Oh, there you go. Oh, go ahead. Please ask a question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. This is a very interesting talk. I have a pretty minor question about a WH question involving uh, the cognate. Like exactly what does that mean? Because uh, for me, the only possible answer is a laugh. Um, if you ask, what did he laugh? So could it be asking about the way he laughs, like a loud laugh, is a soft laugh or something like that? Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. And um, um, and we, we, uh, we encountered a similar question early, uh, earlier. Uh, namely, what are the alternatives to 34B? Uh, and um, and um, I we haven't had a time to uh, check, go back and check with the, our speaker. And I, I imagine we it's possible to get a, a, a more specific answer instead of the uh, um, um, for instance uh, a weekly laugh or if in Chang there is a particular word. Uh, word for, uh, let's say, uh, um, some, um, yeah, some, 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 some laugh with, yeah, um, like a wicked, yeah, a wicked laugh, a, a sarcastic laugh, uh, and yeah, that would be my uh, guess. And just a related point, uh, in uh, the, the word, the verb laugh and, and take a uh, uh, a, a human uh, DP directly, like John laugh, uh, 
John Louis married mean John laughed at uh, at not Mary, and in that case, uh, Mary cannot be questioned with uh, with uh, uh, instead you you have to ask uh, you have to use who to uh, in order to be answered with uh, Mary. So yeah, uh, so yeah, we don't know yet at this moment what are the alternative answers to thirty four B, but we will definitely check in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, there's one other question in the Q&A from Irina Burukina. So maybe I'll just read this out. Um, is there any difference in the behavior between those cognate objects that are unique for their verbs and those where the verb allows a broader range of objects? So to smile a smile being one where it's unique versus to dance a dance or a polka or various things. Uh, I'm asking because the Russian differences that you show seem to match this distinction like instrumental objects uh, rather prefer to fall in the first group and um, accusative in the second. Right. Th yeah. Thank you for the question. Uh, we don't know enough yet, but I do. I did notice there is a, a distinction between regular noun objects and uh, cognitive objects with respect to whether they can be uh, they can be uh, focused. Um, uh, I think you you yeah you can uh, in the the one way to fo uh, to fo to focalizing an object is to uh, to I think Colin and Harold will talk about this later to redu to do re reduplication uh, and um, of the verb uh, for instance to say John um, John again using pseudo Chang uh, using the English words to say John uh, laughed. Um, uh, John John sing John sing a song something like that, uh, that or John danced the ballet in order to say it is a ballet or it is a uh, is a ballet that John danced and what you can do is to reduplicate the verb and that's not the case with cognitive object that's so that's one distinction I thought. so namely you literally you cannot say it is a laugh that John laughed uh, in Chang using a verb reduplication so yeah that's one distinction. Okay, thanks. Uh, are there any other questions? We have a few more minutes. Can I just ask a question? Uh, yeah, go ahead. And there's, there's one other after, but we probably have time for both. Yeah. And then let the, that's fine. Let the other one go. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this is a question from uh, Aleka Blackwell. Does any of this change based on the type of clause, for example, to exclamative versus declarative? Sorry. Yeah, thank you for the question. We only, sorry, we, we haven't checked uh, exclamatives, or we only checked. Uh, um, declarative, declaratives and uh, interactives, and they are possible to occur with both uh, causal types. And we haven't checked exclamatives. Uh, we will, yeah, we can, we should do that. Thank you for the question. Harold, do you want to go and go ahead and ask the other question you were thinking of? Sure, I was just going to say, so in 41 and 42, y'all showed that under negative inversion that the, the uh, this uh, cognate object, like it can invert. So I was just curious as to how adjuncts work under negative inversion. So do they also invert, or do the adjuncts like stay behind the the verb? Uh, sorry, yeah. Thank you for the question. I I don't think we have the data yet. Okay. But, uh, we, yeah, we will definitely check. Uh, Blake, do you by chance have that? Um, I don't uh, remember specific examples off the top of my head, but I don't believe that adjuncts do invert, at least in the same way. Um, so there is a difference there, but I, again, will have to check for the specific examples. Thank you. Okay, any more questions for the first talk? 
Oh, yeah, one more quick question we'll try and do in just a minute or two. Um, I'd like to ask if you could expand on the statement that cognate objects seem to demote other arguments. This is the case that in Chang, when you add to Mary, the preposition disappears. Yeah, so yeah, thank you for the question. So um, the uh, our observation is that uh, um, a, a DP like Mary can, so yeah, sometimes uh, in GUI to lab behaves like a, a two phase predicate, and then it can take a DP like Mary directly without uh, uh, any uh, preposition. So to say John left and Mary, you can literally say John la we Mary uh, without the uh, preposition. And yes, yeah, so, 44B is just the example of talking an object, John Lawi Lawi. And interestingly, uh, when you have both a regular noun object like Mary and also a cognitive object to a co occur, uh, what, uh, what seems to happen is that the cognitive object uh, demote the, uh, the, the other one. So uh, to say John left and left at Mary, you get John, uh, John Lawi Lawi near Mary. But in this case, the proposition uh, is a victory. It seems that the uh, Mary now become, is demoted into an oblique. And um, so, uh, so yeah, we don't know much yet at this moment regarding this uh, structure. And yeah, we will, uh, we will keep looking. And uh, if what, in case you are wondering what happens if you get rid of the preposition, you get either a, a slight, a, the, the, the speaker can force a benefactive benefactive reading for uh, for the for for Mary, so we can get either John left left for Mary, something like that, or um, or John left at the way uh, Mary left, which literally is just John left uh, Mary's left. We get the possessive interpretation. Okay. Thank you. So um, we'd better move on to the next talk. So thanks to our first speakers. Um, and uh, so a link just went up into the chat to, uh, this is the handout for the second talk, the handout for the talk just about to start. So this talk is um, from uh, Colin Brown and Harold Torrance from UCLA uh, on predicate focus doubling in Chang implications for causal syntax. All right, thanks everyone for coming. All right, so in our, our talk today, we're gonna um, investigate and analyze the construction that's in 1B. So this is the predicate focus doubling construction. So you notice that in 1B, there are two instances of the verb cry and the entire sentence is, as, tr as the translation indicates, um, uh, shows that there is you know, emphasis or focus on the verb cry. So looking at a case like 1B, this is the thing that immediately comes to mind is the predicate cleft construction, which is found in many of the West African Niger Congo languages and in the Atlantic Creoles. So these are cases like in 2B uh, from a qua language, Abitime, where you notice that there, once again, are two instances of the verb read in this case. However, one sort of immediate difference between the uh, predicate, oh gosh, the predicate uh, focus doubling construction in, in Chang in 1, in 1B and the, uh, predicate cleft construction in 2B is that the predicate cleft construction seems to activate or involve the left periphery of the clause, the left edge, while the uh, predicate focus doubling construction in, one, in 1B seems to involve stuff that's on the right edge or the right side of the clause. So we'll see much more of this as we go on. Okay, so in our talk today, we're gonna argue that the predicate focus doubling uh, construction in Chang provides evidence for the existence of a low focus position. So that is to say a focus position, which is not left peripheral. Instead, it's actually somewhere around the, the little VP edge. Uh, this is as argued previously in, in some other work. Um, and we're gonna also argue that the, that the PFP construction is derived in two steps. The first is that a, a verb that is focused or has a plus focus feature um, moves or head moves to this low focus position and then subsequently, the, let's see, the original instance of the verb, the first copy, um, that entire VP actually moves to a position that's higher than, than the low focus position. And this will derive the correct surface order. 
So we're gonna have, the talk is organized in this way. We will give a little bit of language background, talk about the interpretive properties of PFD. When do you use this? What is its function? And then section four contains the meat of the talk. We talk about the analysis and then we'll conclude uh, with uh, some future directions. All right, so um, Chang is also called Yamba or Bamileke Chang. It's a Grassfields language spoken in, um, in Cameroon. Um, so there are approximately 300,000 speakers. So as kind of indicated in the previous talk, uh, Chang it has a well-deserved reputation for having a ferocious and complicated uh, tonal system. Uh, we won't have any, anything really to say about that. Uh, the unmarked word order, as you see, in, is given in four. So it's subject, tense, father, the verb, and then the object. Although again, in the previous talk, we saw that you could, under certain cases, you could disrupt this word order, for example, under negation. So like the other Bamileke languages, there are a bunch of uh, past and future tenses in Chang, so about five pasts and about five futures. Um, so most of the examples in this talk are gonna be in what we would call the distant past with P4. In addition, in this talk, we're gonna call the zone, the area between the, um, between the subject and the lexical verb, we'll just call it the preverbal field. Now, uh, Chang also has a number of, let's say, particles, auxiliaries, um, adverbs, and prepositional phrases that can, can or must occur in the pre-verbal field, so between the subject and the main verb. As you see in five, we have where we have one of these particles, this ze, which means again, when the when one of these particles occurs in the pre-verbal field, the main verb um, has what we will call the consecutive form. So it basically has a nasal prefix. And as you see here in again in five, uh, the main verb is now is da. Okay. Um, so another uh, complication is that um, in the distant past, um, negation is bipartite, as you see in six. So there is a particle, uh, sorry, the negative particle here that occurs um, between the tense uh, and, the, and, the, and the main verb, but does not trigger the consecutive form. And then on the right edge of the clause, there is also a, a moraic um, uh, a negative marker. And right, so in seven, so if you kind of put these things together, you get something like seven. We note in passing that one generalization is that in certainly in Chang and some of the other Grassfields languages that the past tenses precede negation, precede neg one, and that the future tenses follow negation. So there's a syntactic difference between the uh, past and, and future, past and non-past tenses. Great. So now we're going to move on to what we called the interpretive property, properties of predicate focus doubling. Um, so we're basically addressing the question of when do we use this construction and kind of what elements can enter into this construction. So right off the bat in eight, we can see that this construction is used to contract, contrastively focus uh, mark the verb. So if you have a question, so if A asks a question such as, do so you cook the plantains? You could answer something like, so I cut the plantains. So uh, kind of as opposed to cooking them, I cut them. Um, if we try to focus other elements using this construction, such as an object, uh, that does not work. So 9b shows us trying to use predicate focus doubling to focus the object, and this is um, not, not done. Um, Another thing that this construction is not is not it's not virum focus. So it's not used to emphasize the truth or propositional content of a sentence. So um, A may make this assertion, this negative assertion that Mary did not clean the floor. And if in B2, if you try to use predicate focus doubling to say to assert that she did in fact clean the floor, um, again, this doesn't work. So it seems to be marking contrast of verbal focus and not virum and not object focus, for example. Um, we find that doubling is restricted to verbal elements as well. So um, 11b, we might want to have a sentence where we're uh, kind of placing the contrastive focus on uh, this temporal, or no, this, um, this adverbial element, ze, again. Um, but you can't copy it. So meri le ze and za'a kindong ze is, uh, again, ungrammatical. So this is a nonverbal element, and we cannot uh, do this predicate focus doubling construction. However, it is possible to copy verbs that are used functionally, such as those that are used in serial verb constructions. So we have a lexical verb give, which has this kind of benefactive reading in the serial construction. So 
among the Zuk and Zetmo and Jay Shufo. So I clean the baby poop, give Shufo. Uh, and it has this benefactor breeding, like I cleaned it for Shufo. So as expected, we can we can copy the kind of lexical uh, main verb in this construction, as we see in B, so zuk, zuka, um, which may appear before or after that kind of serial construction. Um, and in one C, we also see that we can copy this uh, this give verb, the kind of benefactive serial verb. So among the zuk and zetmo and je shufo ye. Um, and this has this kind of contrastive reading of I clean the baby poop for shufo instead of I clean the baby poop for shufo which we see in B. Um, it is not possible to copy both, <laughs> basically. So 13 just shows uh, various uh, attempts at trying to have both verbs in the serial verb construction copied, and it just does not work. So to kind of conclude this uh, section, uh, we have this construction, which is used in which we have two copies of the same verb uh, that occur in a single clause, and it marks the verb for contrastive, focus. Okay. All right. So um, as I mentioned uh, just a couple of minutes ago, we're going to argue that the uh, that this construction, PFP construction involves a position, a low focus position. So the first piece of evidence from this comes from the fact that, as you see in 14, that, um, the, that, the, that the focused verbs are always occur to the right of the tense markers. So in the previous cases um, that we've shown you, this was all it was the case of the distant past. 14 is just another, just to show an example from the distant future. So no matter what tense marker you have, this, this uh, verbal focus, this PFB stuff always occurs to the right of the tense markers. Um, the second uh, comes, piece of evidence comes to the fact that Chang independently has a left peripheral focusing construction. So this is shown in 15. So it's where it's a pig that I killed. So, ah, gonna eat. So there, again, the, the direct object pig is, occurs on the left edge of the clause. So there is independently a left, a, a, a left edge focusing construction where the focused element precedes the subject and all the tense markers. Okay. Um, and so if we sort of take the, the data from left, for, let's say left peripheral focus and what we'll call low focus, you get something like 16, right? So you have this left peripheral focus, subject, tense markers, and then again, lower to the right, you have the, the the verb doubling. So 17 shows that it's actually possible to get left peripheral focus co-occurring with what we are saying is the low focus, right? So, you know, it's vampires that I insulted instead, or it's vampires that I insulted. So in 17, so the focused object, uh, vampires, so, milieu, so that is a, it's a left edge focus. And then you look on the, uh, the right edge of the clause and you see that uh, the PFD construction, so zo de zo di, um, occurs there. All right, so the fact that you can get these two distinct foci co-occurring, uh, we can make sense of this if they're not competing for the same left peripheral position. So no matter what we say, there have, it looks like there has to be at least two distinct fo uh, focus positions in Chong. So just given its position, we conclude then that there is a focus position lower than tense in Chong. So now we're going to go a bit deeper into the relative ordering of the kind of the two verbs that we find, as well as other elements in the clause, and kind of start building towards our analysis. So we do this by asking these broad questions of what occurs before the first verb, what is sandwiched between the two verbs, what occurs after the two verbs. And we have the following generalizations. So any element that occupies the preverbal field in a canonical SEO sentence also precedes both verbs in the predicate focus construction. Uh, and we saw examples of this in the previous subsection. Uh, here we talk about direct object, indirect object, some uh, verbal, post-verbal adjuncts. Uh, they must occur after the first verb and before the second verb. Um, we also find that some post-verbal temporal adjectives or like including temporal adjective or adjuncts sorry, uh, must occur following the second verb. And then we also see some data from say causal arguments uh, that show that they may proceed or follow the second verb. So there's some optionality here as well. So jumping into the internal arguments uh, in 18, we find direct objects uh, must occur between the two verbs basically. So you have Mary, Leza'a, Kendong, Za'a. 
So Mary cut plantains, and you cannot have something like Mary Reza Kindong. Uh, these are flat out rejected. And uh, same in 19, we see the basic, the, the same, the same thing happening with um, indirect objects or in kind of double object constructions as well. So all of the internal arguments must be uh, linearized to the left of the second verb. Um, so building towards our, um, our analysis here. So although this, uh, this construction involves two copies of the verb, they don't have to be strictly identical copies. So in the following, we see uh, the right edge of the second verb is altered. So 20b, for example, among the ko yim ko, uh, um, you have a different vowel here and you have a different tone here at the right edge. And we see the same in 21a or 21b. So the first copy of the verb is nongo and then the second one is nong. Um, so yeah, we, uh, we use this to argue that the second copy of the verb has a suffix when it's focused. Uh, you might say, why is this a suffix in, in b here? <laughs> Um, it's kind of a moraic suffix, which will kind of get uh, absorbed into certain, like if you have a, a nasal coda, for example, it doesn't surface uh, kind of segmentally, whereas other types of um, codas, you will actually see this thing overtly apart from just its tone. So um, we conclude that the suffix verb copy is the result of it having head moved or being copied to the focus head and we propose this following two-step uh, derivation of predicate focus doubling. So in the first step, which we see in 22, uh, a verb bearing a focus feature undergoes head movement to uh, the focus head. So zoop, presumably coming from a lower VP. Um, and then in step two, uh, your little VP undergoes movement to spec folk P. So you have phrasal movement of your, uh, your VP to the spec of the focus uh, phrase, uh, thus linearizing before the copy of the verb and the head, uh, the focus head, which is this moraic tonal suffix. So this captures the relative ordering of our subject tense, whatever comes before in the pre-verbal field, uh, our initial verb, our internal arguments of the verb, and our second verb, which is focus marked. So this analysis is also compatible with previous analyses of predicate focusing or predicate focus constructions in other grass fields languages by these so Nue and Schupermann. And it also makes some predictions about the linearization of other elements, which we uh, address below. So uh, here's some data from certain adjuncts and clausal arguments. So the derivation that we proposed in just above in uh, 21 and or 22 and 23 makes the following pre uh, predictions. So we would predict that high post-verbal adjuncts should surface after V2, after the second verb. And we might also predict that clausal or TP complements of embedding verbs should appear before the focused copy of the verb. Um, so the prediction one is, is clearly borne out. So you have temporal adjuncts such as zo yesterday uh, which obligatorily surface after the second verb. So 24a, so I was tired yesterday. Um, we cannot have the copy of the verb occurring after this temporal um, adverb. So this follows if we assume that zo is joining to a higher position than the focus phrase. <coughs> um, Prediction two regarding clausal or TP arguments uh, is less clear. So we find actually, so in 25, 26, and 27, TP and CP arguments may optionally precede or follow the second verb. So um, in 25, we have a kind of tenseless or TP argument of the verb to remember. So among the quang tu, le jeu le jeu so that's the first option where you have uh, the copied verb occurring before the TP argument. The second option is where you have the copied verb occurring after the TP argument. And 26 and 27 just show us basically the same optionality with the positioning of the second verb with respect to a CP complement. Um, 
So this is not straightforwardly predicted by our analysis, which would predict that the little vp containing the TP or CP complement would move to the spec folk p position linearizing to the left of the second verb. Um, an obvious solution for this is that this is in fact exactly what happens, but there's some sort of shifting of the TP or CP complement to the final position. Um, this might predict that we should see things such as heavy NP shift elsewhere in Chong, which in fact we do. So we see this in 28 and 29. In 28, we have um, a relative clause direct object. So mong le tune ken denga yi meri le pie. And if I harvested the bananas that Mary planted, um, the copied verb can occur immediately before the direct object or after. Uh, so contra what we saw earlier with direct objects, which uh, obligatorily occurred sandwiched between the verb copies, when you have a heavy direct object, um, you have the same optionality that we observed uh, with TP and CP arguments. So um, to conclude this little subsection, certain adverbs which occur to the right of V2 corroborate our basic structure that we introduced before if they are in fact located higher than the focus phrase. And this kind of optional linearization we see with uh, kind of clausal complements with respect to the second verb can be explained if they're analyzed as undergoing some sort of post syntactic shift. All right, so in this uh, section, I just wanted to follow up on a couple of the points that, that uh, Colin made towards the end. So sort of looking again at some of these you know, cases where the verb does not, the focused verb doesn't show up in, in the clause final position. So you can also see this in 30 with case, things like uh, post-verbal manner adverbs. So these also can optionally, if you look in 30A versus 30B, there seems to be optionality whether they are, whether these kinds of manner adverbs occur between the two verbs or at the end of the, at the end of the sentence on the right edge. Um, you can also see this in 31B uh, with, um, with locative, locative PPs. So 31B shows that the locative PP can either occur in preceding the second copy of the verb or following the second copy of the verb. And the only thing, the thing that is obligatory is that the direct object, the simple direct object has to occur uh, preceding between the two verbs. Okay? Um, and in 32, we see that there's an additive particle. So this also, so the way this one is actually quite interesting because if you look in 32A, we have Shupo, Shupo trembled. Um, but in 32B, if you want to say Shusa also, also trembled, you see that the this additive particle actually has to occur between the two copies of the verb and it cannot occur to, uh, to the right of the second copy of the verb. So the, you know, so the sort of point here is just that, you know, what the sort of the simple derivation, well, moderately simple derivation that we presented in the previous section is actually po is probably going to need to be enriched or made to be a little bit more complicated. So if you look in 33, right, if we imagine that, right, so what we have to get is this, um, let's say, variability or op apparent optionality between, you know, in the position of the, of the focused verb with respect to this post-verbal material. So if we have something like 33, where we have this low focus position, that's why I have it there below TP, then you know, we have these adverbials or locative PPs merged above little VP. What seems to always happen, given our analysis, is that, that the focus verb moves to the uh, head moves to focus. And then something like that little VP always raises higher than that focus. Okay? So the variable seems to be for one way of essential way of thinking about this, the variable is how much material from below focus gets pie piped with the with with uh, VP, et cetera. Uh, anyway, so that was just the idea here is just that there are other things to explore here. All right, and to quickly conclude, um, we've introduced this PFD construction and proposed an analysis in which the verb undergoes copy movement to a low focus head followed by phrasal movement to a little VP position or of the little VP to a spec focus phrase. Um, so this analysis provides additional cross linguistic evidence for uh, the existence of a focus projection below the TP IP level and above the little VP level. Um, in addition to a higher left peripheral focus position, which is also active uh, in this language. So we included a couple little points of why this is a, just an interesting construction. So there's 
uh, it's a verb copying construction that involves the right edge of the clause, contra a lot of the work that's been done on predicate clefts, which involve the left edge of the clause. So we have this kind of right edge process in the left-headed language, which is interesting. Um, and it can lead to a lot of insights about just kind of nailing down the general syntax of Chong and other grass fields languages, including re relative positioning of functional and lexical heads. And just that this is also like very under described this construction. So there's been surprisingly little attention paid to it. Um, so there's some precedent uh, cited here, but yeah, there's a lot of work to be done. So thank you. Okay, thank you. We have um, a few minutes we can take for questions. Um, so we can take questions either in the chat or the uh, dedicated Q&A um, window. So there's one um, early in the chat. So uh, from Elena Benedicto um, says, wondering what happens in SVC in particular when the second or third verb is focalized and whether there are minimality effects when the second verb is focalized, if it's an instance of head movement. So that's an interesting question. So, um, you're talking, so I think you're talking about in the case where we have the verb give, let's say, um, when it's, let's say functional, but it's in a serial construction, what happens, you know, when it's, when it's focused? I think that's what you mean. So, yeah, in those cases, we don't have very much idea of exactly what is going on with serial verb constructions in the language. I mean, with the fact that you can get... The fact that you can get the you know the second verb in a serial um, uh, focus, I mean, would certainly be consistent with the fact that this is a low focus position. So whatever is occurring, you know, in the uh, the, the serialized verbs is not you know is is never really a CP or anything like that, right? So this at least might you might expect to be able to get you know to get low focus but not high focus in those cases. Yeah. Can I follow up? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, serial verb constructions that have shown that the second verb is, em is embedded under the first one. So some sort of uh, Larsonian structure, uh, in which case, in order for the second one to go up to the lower um, focus position, it would have to climb over the first one. Does that make sense? Yeah, so we have, okay, the, I think there's a, maybe one difference here. So if you're talking about the serial verb case, I guess it depends on what kind of serial construction you're talking about. Are you talking about, you know, bought a chicken and ate it kind of thing? Because that's a little, you know, maybe a little bit different from, you know, this sort of benefactive case that we show where you have a really a, sort of a more of like a functional verb. So the, I mean, the thing is that what they would suggest then in, in those cases, when you have bought a chicken and ate it, um, would be one where whatever is occurring, it's Basically, you have to have a bigger structure in the in the second in in the in the lower verb. So even if they're embedded under the high under something like you know the first verb, what you have below, let's say for the eat, I bought a chicken and ate it. In, you know, um, you'd have to have more than just a simple VP. That's the idea. So you know, at least these cases for Chong, the fact that you can get that second verb focus in Chong would suggest that it really isn't just a verb taking another verb as a complement. In those cases, you actually have some kind of I'm not sure how they're connected, but whatever is this is the you know the following, following verbs in the serial construction have to be it's bigger than just a simple BP. Which would Thanks, avoid, and I would be oh sorry, which would avoid the problem of jumping over heads and things like that. Right, right. So if you develop that, I would be very interesting to see interested to see it. Thank so you. Would, so would we. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, the, there's another question from uh, Brian Su. Um, can the PFD construction occur with intransitive predicates, or is it ruled out since it would create an adjacent verb sequence? Perfectly fine. Yeah. Yeah. So it could occur with uh, basically unergatives and unaccusatives. Um, if you have like a state of predicate that you double, you get this kind of, I don't know, it's like, like the mango was simply sweet yeah. like you get this kind of reading of like it's like legitimately uh this is the case but yeah no problem 
Okay. And so the next question is from Katie Russell. Um, are there verbal affixes in Chang, uh, like causative or applicative? And if, say, if so, do they appear in both copies of the verb? That's an excellent question. Excellent. Um, the problem is that although there are some semi-productive affixes, they really, it's really not clear what the distribution is. So for example, there's a verb that means like cut, but then you can put on like this, this T suffix that means something like, you know, like chopped something, right? So like a repetitive, but that you can't really, it's with that verb or with a small class of verbs, it's very lexically idiosyncratic because, you know, if I say, you know, you know somebody repeatedly jumped or something like that, you cannot use that. Um, affix. So there doesn't really seem to be, there's so, yeah, sorry, in a nutshell, there's, as far as I know, no causative morphology, um, affixal causatives, um, things like that in Chang, where you could test what you're talking about. Yeah. But those do occur in the copy, right? So if you have, if you have those kind of non-productive or semi-productive. Like, yeah, sorry, those do get copied. Yeah, so actually the one you were just, the one that uh, Colin just mentioned, so that would be something, again, the, because it's idio, they're idiosyncratic. So if you have a verb like to be sweet, so this le t, that really is bimorphemic. It's le plus this affix t. But when you do this construction, it's simply sweet. It's, you know, it's le t, le t. So you still get it copied. Yeah. Okay, are there any other questions? I'll give it a little bit. Maybe people were really planning on a 12 o'clock ending. That's okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, okay. Oh, I guess I'll note um, there was, so the handout for the first talk, uh, Colin did post that, no, sorry, Blake did post that a few minutes ago. So if you scroll up a little bit in the chat, you can find a link to the handout for the first talk. Um, there's one other question we can take a few minutes. So another question from Katie Russell. If there aren't, um, I'm curious about the focus suffix. Uh, is its identity predictable from the phonology? Um, yes, but I don't know what the phonology is. Um, so <laughs> this, this is so, um, I'm just saying that because I'm figuring it has to be. Um, so that is, we are currently investigating exactly what predicts the realization of that that focus uh, affects, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. So most likely. Uh, okay, I, it looks like I think, I don't think there are any other questions, so uh, at this point, we can thank all of our speakers. Um, and um, there are links to the handouts in the chat. So please have a look at those if you want. Um, otherwise, I will uh, end the session here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.